In the meantime, if you have any questions, feel free to um, put them in the chat and I'll try and address them as we go. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Sharon. Thank you, Heather. I appreciate the uh, introduction. Thank you very kindly for that. And welcome everybody. I'm really excited that so many of you are eager to learn about landscaping with native plants to attract birds to your yard. It's a subject that obviously I'm passionate about. So let's get started. But I am gonna start with some sort of depressing information. And that is the headline that you may have seen yourself some time ago that 3 billion birds have been lost over the last 40 years. For many of us, that's within our lifetimes and we remember well when there were, there were metal larks on every fence post and everywhere we went in the grasslands. And now if I hear a metal lark singing, I come to a screeching stop so that I can listen their populations have declined dramatically. And that's more than a quarter of North America's entire avian population. That's significant. More than a quarter of our birds are gone. And of course, there are lots of reasons, and that's not the purpose of this program. But one of the things that's connected is this, and that is that plummeting insect numbers threaten the collapse of nature. I don't know what some of you are probably thinking, hey, it's okay for the bugs, I don't like bugs. But you know, you have to think about what that really means. 40% of all insect species are in decline. Beginning of another extinction because as things move up the food chain, much of life is affected when we lose a primary food source of insects for birds and other creatures. So, ah, Heather, I'm not moving ahead. Oh, there it goes, there it goes. I'm moving ahead now. So you may be asking yourself, well, what does any of this have to do with landscaping for birds? And that's what this program is about. I'm going to use chickadee frequently as we talk about the birds, because we all know chickadees. Those of you in the northern part of the state have the black capped chickadee, and those of us down south have the Carolina chickadee. They look very much alike. They behave very much the same way. And so here we are at chickadee. We know chickadees well. They come to our yards. They visit our feeders. We feed them seeds all winter and we know that they love their seeds. But I wanna take that a step further and talk about their nesting because nestling chickadees, those little babies in that cavity box eat 390 to 570 caterpillars per day, per day. Well, the very range of numbers has to do with how many babies they have because they can have anywhere from four to even 11 or 12. So given an average there, that's about 9,000 caterpillars until they fledge. So if you can't have 9,000 caterpillars in your yard, you can't have sustainable populations of chickadees. That's fairly sobering. So where do all these caterpillars come from? Aha, uh -huh, you guessed it, from our landscaping. And we're here today to talk about how that all works together and what we as landowners and land caregivers can do about that. So how does landscaping uh, for birds differ from others? Well, birds are irrevocably tied to the vegetation around them. And, and I'll just stop with that part of the sentence. They are irrevocably tied to the vegetation around them. And if you, you'll think back before we folks ever came around birds millions of years ago, these are after all our only remaining dinosaurs. 
And these birds have always depended on what was around them to survive. That vegetation provided them food, for instance, whether that be seeds, nectar, pollen, nuts, berries, buds, leaves, and the insects that those plants host. Vegetation provides all of their food. It also provides their shelter against weather, both winter and summer. We sometimes forget about how they need shelter in the summer against predators day and night and 24 seven while nesting. And of course, the vegetation provides what's necessary for nesting, both the places to nest, as well as the materials from which they build their nests. So let me just give you an example of what I mean when I say that birds are irrevocably tied to the vegetation around them. You see, they share this symbiotic evolutionary relationship with native plants going back thousands and thousands of years. And so I show you here on the left, the native winterberry, and on the right, a hybrid winterberry, what you might buy in your nursery, for instance. And I was standing at the park one day looking at the hybrid winterberry, and I heard a gentleman's voice behind me say, Sharon, you don't want that. And I turned to find a very good friend who was the botanist there at that park. And I said, why would I not want that? And he said, because the birds don't eat it. And I said, oh really, why is that? And he said, they don't recognize it as food. You know, look at the native winterberry, it's red. It's what the birds are accustomed to. It's what they evolved with. This is a native plant that goes back thousands of years, just like they do. And we introduce a hybrid winter berry with yellow berries and they don't recognize that as food at all. So that's a significant point to be made. So let's talk about this evolutionary relationship with the native plants and the two big results that have such an impact on birds. First of all, non-native plants don't provide the nutrition equal to that of the native plants. So look at this, this native winterberry and compare it with the non-native Amur bush honeysuckle. Birds will eat both of those berries. They like them both. But that native winterberry provides about 50% fats or lipids the kind of thing that they need to put on weight, to survive the winter, to migrate, to get energy. On the other hand, when they eat the non-native Amur or bush honeysuckle, they get 5% nutrition. So compare the two, 50% versus 5%. Why would you even allow non-native Amur bush honeysuckle to grow in your yard knowing that basically it's like feeding your kids or your grandkids potato chips. They love them, they fill up on them, their little bellies get full, and then they don't want to eat the stuff that's really going to give them the nutrition they need to grow and thrive. So, yep, it doesn't provide the nutrition. But the second result is that non native plants don't support native bugs that feed the birds. And I'm using that term bugs sort of generally, it's any stage of bug, whether it's eggs, the larva, or the adult farm. So when I use that term, keep in mind that that's, that's what I'm talking about. So again, it's an evolutionary thing. The bugs have evolved with the plants, have evolved with the birds. And so non-native plants, if we bring in Asian plants, for instance, like so many of our hybrids and so many of our nursery plants are, those plants are not going to support our native bugs to provide food for our native birds. So let me give you yet another example of that. For instance, look at oak trees. Native oak trees, in research that Doug Talamy has done um, at the University of uh, Delaware, he says native oak trees support 557 known moths and butterflies, meaning that this is where they lay their eggs. These are host plants for the pollinators. And you've, had, you've already talked about pollinators a week or so ago. So these native oaks support 557 known moths and butterflies. 
But ginkgo trees, those Asian trees, support three. So if you want to provide food for the birds via native bugs, obviously you don't want to plant ginkgo trees. You may want to plant one for yourself, but you're certainly not going to plant them for the birds. So they are non-native plants that don't support native bugs. And why is that important? Because 96% of all songbirds feed their babies bugs. So you have to first feed the birds, or to feed the birds, you must first feed the bugs. So let's talk about how that happens in our yards and on our various properties that we're being caretakers of. You'll remember that number we gave you earlier, 350 to 570 cal caterpillars per day, depending on the number of nestlings. And this little chickadee has brought the other adult chickadee a caterpillar to feed the babies. And the babies are inside this tiny little cavity in this old crabapple snag. So what's this all about? Every day, every day, we've got to have 350 to 570 caterpillars. So how does adding natives increase the bird population in the yard? Or maybe the better question for those of us who might be doubting Thomas's, does it? Does it really work? So being the doubting Thomas that I am, I did two yard counts seven years apart. I had a, a native, mostly native garden that was about 100 feet by 40 feet. And I felt pretty good about what I was doing. And I counted that, that seven, the first count I did, I had 114 species in my yard for the year. Not individuals now, different species. And I thought, by golly, you know, that's not bad. I'm, I'm pretty pleased with that. And I counted all the birds that came even in the summer just to nest. I counted the ones that came only in the winter just to get away from the high Arctic and pretend that Southern Indiana was the Caribbean. Some of them just migrated through. They were uh, interested enough in our yard that they stopped here as a stopover during spring migration. They weren't here more than a day or so, and off they went again, came back in the fall during late fall migration and were more leisurely. So some were here for only a brief time, but there was something here that attracted them. And then, of course, some were with us all year. So I counted all those, had 114. And after that initial yard count, things kind of went bad here. We'd been living here for almost 50 years and we lost three massive trees. One was about to uproot that you see here. We cut it into a snag. Another was dying of disease and another was hit by lightning. And after those three trees were removed, my front yard looked like this and I was devastated. I don't, I'm not too embarrassed to tell you I cried. This massive oak that stood on this bare spot meant that the entire front yard was a shade garden. Now it's a full sun garden. But I want you to look at this spot and look at where you're standing and realize that here's an opportunity. Because after all, the National Audubon Society said, you should be planting natives for birds. And the National Wildlife Federation said, got to plant natives for birds. And the American Bird Conservancy said, you must, it's essential that you plant natives for birds. And Cornell Lab of Ornithology said, it is an absolutely essential element that everybody add natives if we're going to save the birds. Well, that was pretty strong stuff. So I felt that I probably should do my part. And so I started with this, I kind of get your bearings. You're standing over the corner of the side, you're seeing a utility post in the background and a, and a yard barn back there. And 
at the end of a year, a year later, it looked like this. And those are all native plants. You can still see where you're standing. You still see the yard barn down there. So who says natives have to be ugly or rangy? It points out in this illustration that not all natives are equal. Some of them are more appropriate for the yard than others. And if you don't learn anything else today, I hope you learn that not all natives are equal for birds either. And so let's talk about this business of whether natives matter. You'll remember that that first count was 114. And then after the trees came down and we had to replant and I added all those natives, the new year long count, did it go up? It was 135. That's almost a 20% increase in bird species populations over that previous count seven years ago. Now, you know, if you're starting with 114 species, you're already up there. And to get many more is really quite a challenge. So you bet those native plants made a difference. And what a difference, 20%. But here's another number. Of those 135, only 29 came to feeders. Because you see, supporting birds is about way more than feeders and feed. It's always habitat. So you already know what brought the other 106 species to the yard, don't you? You're way ahead of me on that. The other 79% were there because of the habitat. We've already said that, that birds are just irrevocably connected to the vegetation around them. And survival is always about habitat, the food, the shelter, the nest sites, the materials, and the water. And the important thing is that plants provide everything but the water. And there are some plants that provide water. The more diverse the native habitat, the more you offer in those plantings, the more native bugs they will support, and the more diverse the bird species it attracts and supports. So how does this landscaping for birds differ from any other? It's planted with at least 70% native plants, and that's measured by biomass. But these plants can be of many kinds, and we're gonna start with what I'm gonna call the keystone plants. You know the keystone in an arch. If that keystone is missing, the whole thing collapses. And the keystone plants to get this 70% native would be trees. But again, not just any trees, native trees. And in order, the number one native tree should be some kind of oak. If you don't have some kind of oak, plant it. Next, wild cherry. And don't go to the nursery and say you want a cherry tree because you know what they'll, they'll give you is some sort of fruit tree. You're looking for a wild black cherry tree, native, a native tulip tree, or a native willow, and native evergreens. So those five should be your targets. Those are the keystone plants to reach that 70% that native in your yard. So what happens if you have those native plants? Here's a Northern Perula foraging on a pin oak because look what's in this pin oak supporting native bugs. The uh, yellow warbler in a willow tree finding caterpillars there. Shelter in eastern red cedar. It's a wonderful, wonderful plant. And that tree is probably my favorite tree in the whole yard, not just for the shelter, for all those berries. They're actually tiny cones, of course. But why do you think this bird's called a cedar waxwing? Love those cedar berries. And of course, the bald cypress catkins, the blue gray gnat catcher there the white-breasted nuthatch and the red-breasted nuthatch, for those of you who get them in the wintertime, 
forage in the tree bark looking for insect eggs, as this one has found. And of course, nesting is an essential part of the plants that you put in too, including these hollows of these trees. This is an old sycamore tree with a nice hollow in it. And this great crested flycatcher is nesting there. It's the only flycatcher uh, east of the Rockies that nests in a cavity. And sometimes those trees provide shelter for day roosts. You gotta love this barred owl. I think he robbed the little squirrel's nest, but he'll go away come night and the squirrel can go in. So how does it differ? Okay, we've got those trees. We're aiming toward the 70% by biomass. We've got the trees as the keystone, and then we can move on to shrubs, but again, not just any shrubs. You're looking for shrubs that have berry and seed production. Native evergreens also work, whether they have berry or seed production or not, because of the shelter that they provide. But here's your chance to provide a three season food source for berries. So think of hollies that produce berries in the winter and winter berry, then the withrod viburnum, which our cardinals just love and the white-throated sparrows join them. These berries come on in late fall. Um, the dogwood, uh, gray dogwood is perfect for migrating birds. And if you have those uh, gray dogwoods in your yard with uh, prolific berries, you're going to have a magnet for fall warblers. The American black elderberry produces not only blossoms for the nectar among pollinators, but then the berries for the bluebirds. Of course, buttonbush, it's one of my favorites because the butterflies and the bees absolutely love it. But then in the winter time, you get these seeds. And you can see where the birds have picked apart those tiny, tiny seeds that things like juncos and sparrows love. Okay, so we've got the trees and the shrubs. Now let's consider some vines because for the footprint that they hold, vines give you a great deal of biomass because they go up. It's one of the greatest ways to add biomass to your yard when you have a small footprint that you can share. My favorite vine is probably cross vine, not only for the nectar, but just because it's really, really pretty. Um, the American wisteria is another very fine uh, vine, but be sure, absolutely sure, if you purchase a wisteria, that it's American and not Asian. The Asian vines will just go crazy. If you fall asleep under it, you won't be able to get up when you wake up because it will have vined all around you. So yes, the American wisteria is great for its nectar, for butterflies and hummingbirds. I also like flame honeysuckle, uh, which is also available now in one called John Clayton, which is a native. This is not a hybrid. This is a natural native. Um, uh, honeysuckle and that the hummingbirds have loved. It was a very strong bloomer for me all year last year. And then of course these vines are also great for nesting birds. This happens to be the nest of the northern cardinal and cross vine. Okay so we've got the trees as the keystone, we've added shrubs, we've added vines, and now we're looking at grasses, ferns, and sedges, especially if they are seed producing. Seed producing natives. And so we know that grass hosts a lot of critters. In my own yard, I planted a prairie grass patch. I have 80 plugs set into this spot. As you can see, it's, uh, it has grown quite profusely and is providing a lot of seeds. So the top four, in my opinion, were the big blue stem, little blue stem, Indian grass, and Eastern gamma grass. And I like them all because of the seeds they offer for fall migrating birds and wintering birds. But I also have a patch of switchgrass, native switchgrass. And as you can see from this picture, it has lots of tiny little seeds that are very, very popular with the small birds in the winter. In fact, in late fall, if I want to see an indigo bun, and look at my grass patch because the eagle bunnings feed or breaks a female. So 
and maybe she's a little harder to recognize. But I keep the grass remnants in the garden because they offer shelter in the winter time. And the goldfinches have, have taken shelter in these grass patches. One day I went out in the snow and without realizing, I scared up probably 50 goldfinches. And I felt so bad that I had startled them all. I had no idea they were all tucked into the grasses seeking protection against the cold winds. But I show you this picture for another reason. There's nothing native about grass, not this kind of grass, not lawn grass. There's nothing native about white clover and there's certainly nothing native about dandelions. But this chipping sparrow is foraging for seed here because this lawn is untreated. Remember that if you're trying to provide a natural habitat, pesticides are not part of nature and you will not be using them if you're acting to your yard. So finally, after trees, shrubs, vines, grasses, ferns, and sedges, we get to perennials. And you may be thinking, gosh, why are we waiting till the very end to talk about perennials? Because when somebody tells me, hey, I'll go out and add some natives to my yard, the first thing I do is go out and buy half a dozen coneflowers. Well, remember, we're trying to do 70% native plants by biomass. A half a dozen uh, coneflowers won't go very far toward matching the biomass of an oak tree. Perennials are very important, don't misunderstand, because they provide a lot of nectar and a lot of host plants for a good many moths and butterflies. But not all perennials, even native perennials, are created equal. So, we should be looking at three families of perennials. We should be looking at the aster family, the sunflower family, and the goldenrod family, because these are the best ones for pollinators and for nectar and seed production. So if they're good for pollinators, they're good for birds, because remember the birds are looking not just for the ne nectar and the seed, but also for the bugs. So asters are great. This is the plain old New England aster. The fragrant asters bloom really late here, the very last things to bloom even after a late frost. Then there are the panicled asters and you see them growing here in with the goldenrod. So it makes a lovely combination of colors in the fall. I really do like black-eyed Susans. They get a bad name among gardeners because they do multiply readily, but there's nothing that makes American goldfinches happier than a good patch of black-eyed Susans. The cup plant is another favorite of mine, but they're really tall. These plants get eight feet tall easily, but they're great for nectar and they're great for seed. And surprisingly, you can see right here why it's called a cup plant, because this goldfinch is in the cup. See how the leaves come together here? That holds water. And so that cup is there for the drinking as far as the birds are concerned. Common goldenrod in the fall is a wonderful, wonderful place to watch for warblers. This common yellowthroat, uh, which is a type of warbler, of course, has a bug in, in her beak uh, because she has been feeding regularly in this goldenrod. But goldenrod, the common goldenrod, is very difficult to maintain in your garden because it spreads way too quickly and, way, and, by, and crowding out everything else as it goes. So I would suggest you consider one of the hybrids. And they, they are, um, I, I, I shouldn't call them hybrids, I beg your pardon. I should call them varieties because they are cultivars, not hybrids. And there's a big difference, as you know. This cultivar called Fireworks, and there's another one called Cascade. They are both well behaved. This little patch has been in my garden for almost 10 years and is obviously staying in its place. And every year the warblers come and root through all that goldenrod looking for bugs. So again, how does landscaping for birds differ from other landscaping? Well, we've talked about the kinds of plants. Now let's talk about some general rules of 
good bird landscaping has wide diversity, recognizing that all natives are not of equal quality for birds. We also aim for a diversity to meet the diverse needs at diverse times. Not all birds eat the same thing. You know, they're just like people. They don't all like pizza. They don't all like spaghetti and they don't all like T-bone steaks. They like different kinds of food and they are adapted only to eating those kinds of foods. So variety is the key, but again, it's important that we choose the right natives for that variety. So what should you aim for? Well, you should aim for natural foods year round. Right now, buds and blossoms are really important. Our maple trees are blooming here in Southern Indiana and the birds are plucking those blossoms because there's a tremendous amount of food value in buds and blossoms. Look for berries during three seasons, not just a holly tree that produces berries in the winter, but shrubs that provide berries all three seasons. Nectar, of course, during three seasons seed during three seasons. And I would venture that you should probably aim for four if you can push it that far. And certainly bugs in one form or another in all four seasons, including the eggs that may be buried in the leaves in the wintertime. So yes, they forage in the blossoms in spring. Yes, they, they find nectar in very early blossoms. Yes, they find food value in service berry berries, which are the probably the earliest production berries. The late fall brings dogwood. Winter brings winter berries. We've already mentioned the importance of berry dogwood. They are natural, why not consider Joe Pye weed? I even consider uh, rattlesnake master an important nectar source, not for the birds so much, although the hummingbirds do like it, but for the butterflies. And of course, seeds come in all forms and the Coreopsis, especially tall Coreopsis, is a nice native plant that provides lots of seeds. Goldfinches love it so much, they pluck the petals. They don't even let the seeds <laughs> mature. Um, and then of course, indigo buntings foraging on the fall. Sorry, there we go. Oops, went, went a little too fast there. Um, but this is the toey foraging amid um, the, the spring uh, leaves. Uh, and you've seen toeys probably digging about, uh, flipping leaves over their back. This one seems to have found some sprouts in the early spring leaf. Litter. And then, of course, during migration, they're looking for bugs. In nesting, they're looking for bugs to feed their babies. In fall, again, they're looking for more bugs for that nutrition they need for a long migration in that goldenrod. So yes, there are all these important things to think about, including the variety of heights. Not all birds feed at the same level. Some feed on the ground, some feed all the way up in the high canopy. So low-level plants and mid-level plants up onto the trellis and to the vines, and then high-level plants way up in the trees. But we also need to lay wide swaths of a given plant. Yeah, never go to the nursery and buy one. In fact, I never go to the nursery and buy three. They need a wide enough swath to see the color, to recognize the plant, if it's a single plant, it's hidden away. That's even more true of say butterflies and bees than it is for birds, but it's true of all of them. So plan on wide swaths of a, of a plant to attract attention for the birds. So variety, wide swaths, and then finally a dense setting. I've seen people plant, you know, a coneflower, then mulch, then another coneflower, then a bunch of mulch. And then another coneflower and a bunch of mulch. No, plant them close together so they grow together, so they multiply readily and become visible to the birds and at the same time offer them shelter and protection while they're feeding. A couple of other quick things. Uh, landscaping for birds should include minimal lawn. Think of lawn as an area rug. It's not wall-to-wall -wall carpet that you stick a few things in in the middle. It's just an area rug like pads and borders. 
think of it that way and you'll be doing your birds a big favor. You should also leave the leaves, never clearing them. You know, people rake up their yards, put the, put the debris in plastic bags and set it out on the curb to go to the landfill. Well, you've just sent all your butterflies and moths to the landfill because their eggs are on those leaves. So don't get rid of your leaves. It's okay to break them under a, or blow them under a, a, some shrubs or up against the back fence or wherever you want to pile them up, but don't get rid of them. It's the winter food for birds. They're gonna rake through those leaves and find a few of those eggs to survive. And then finally, leave those frost killed stalks. Uh, people tend to hurry up and get rid of all that debris. I'm only now thinking about getting rid of the frost killed stalks. And even now, I'm not cutting them more than, than down to 18 inches because there are things that, that put their eggs in those stalks. And I don't want to throw those away. So here we have a cardinal. Uh, foraging among the frost-killed hyssop and the doves that have tucked in what little protection there is from those frost-killed stalks, but it's enough to keep them a little warmer in the winter. So how does it really differ? Well, look at this sharp-toothed mountain mint. Here's the answer in a nutshell. In this small frame of that mass, that swath of plants, there are 11 bugs. And so the bottom line is we don't ever, ever, ever use insecticides in the yard. And I would even question the use of dyed mulch. You know, until the manufacturers of mulch can tell us or are willing to tell us exactly what they use to dye that mulch, I have to suspect and a good many other people suspect that it's toxic. So when you choose a colored mulch, it's almost like spreading insecticide all over your garden. Now, maybe someday some manufacturer will be brave enough to tell us what they use. But until they do, I'll never, ever buy it. So keep all of this in mind as you think about protecting your habitat for the birds. And if you need additional information, there's this book out there called Planting Native. Um, I wrote that a few years ago. Uh, it's called Planting Native to Attract Birds to Your Yard. It's good for all states from Minnesota to Louisiana and all parts to the East Coast from there. So that includes basically Eastern, not quite half, but at least the Eastern third of the United States. And I take you through pretty much what we've talked about here today, separating the trees and the shrubs and the vines and talking about why they're good and how they work and in what habitats and what kinds of soils they will work. But we begin with step one to eradicate the invasives. We do that before we move ahead with adding natives. There are a couple of other books out there that you may be familiar with, those of you who are really into birds. Um, I have two other books, uh, Birds in the Yard Month by Month and How Birds Behave, uh, which is my more recent, most recent book. And uh, you may be interested in checking those out too. You can follow me on Facebook, uh, Sharon Sorensen Bird Lady. Um, there are lots of Sharon Sorensons out there, so you have to put in Bird Lady to find me. But I talk every day, or at least every day that I post, I post something about birds and bird habitat. You can check out my website, particularly if you're a beginning birder, or you can contact me via email. So I hope you've enjoyed landscaping with native plants to attract birds to the yard. I, it's truly a passionate subject of mine. So I'm gonna turn it back to Heather and I will stop sharing my screen so that we can have some questions and answers. Thank you so much, Sharon. I, the photographs are beautiful. Um, so yes, we're going to stop the recording now. And by the way, those photographs are all taken in our yard. Yeah, I should have said that early on. <laughs> you should be very proud. It's a work, it's a labor of love, and it's been going on for a long time.